Pastor Dan is speaking on the statement of faith, the Holy Spirit today, but hopefully um, the Steelers will call a few audibles tonight. And so Pastor Dan threw an audible at us today. So that passage in the bulletin that is in front of you is not the passage we'll be reading this morning. So it will be from John chapter 16, verses 4 through 15. I'll give you a few minutes to turn to that. Again, it is John chapter 16, verses 4 through 15. Now, usually at youth group, I usually have a couple of students after I say it five times say, what is it again? So if you want to do that, you, you may do so. What is it again? Thank you. I was waiting for that. <laughs> Brian, it is John chapter 16, verses 4 through 15, and uh, I'm going to read the second part of verse 4, not the very beginning. So it's really 4B through verse 15. Please follow along. I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. Now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you asks me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father. And where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Thank you, Scotty. For leading us in worship today. Let me turn this on now before I forget. Um, so I love the, the banter between the worship leader and people sitting in the pews. That's uh, family, and that's very important, and I, and I love that about our church. Um, we've got news that one of our family lost somebody. Um, Carl Anderson's uh, sister... Um, Ruth Ely went to be with the Lord on Saturday morning, so when one of our own grieves, we all grieve together. So um, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our gracious God, um, the provider of all things, the sustainer of all things, you are, you are Lord, you're a God, and you, uh, you know the innermost of us, the, the inner parts of every aspect of our lives. And you are a God who actually cares about the inner as, uh, aspects of our lives, Lord. You know when we hurt, you know when we laugh, you know everything in between, Lord. And you know when we don't know what to say, that you give us the words to say. So, Father, we lift up our brother to you. We, we ask you for the comfort of the Holy Spirit for him and for Vivian. We thank you for the love that you have for us, the love that you have for us here in this church, the fact that we are family. The, the Holy Spirit that binds us together, the, the union of the Spirit comes through you, and we thank you for that. And Jesus, we thank you for the sacrifice that you made for your accomplishment, the defeat of death, the raising from the grave. We thank you for everything that you do for us. We thank you for hearing us. We thank you for being our God. It's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. 
All right. Um, we called an audible today. Scott mentioned uh, the Steelers. I don't think they're, like, the Holy Spirit can't help the Steelers. Am I right? Like, <laughs> I, I can't believe I just said that. Like, it's amazing. But anyways, um, as you know, um, some of you know that I'm in seminary right now, and one of the really cool aspects of seminary is that we cater, we, we, um, we guide our, my seminary experience to what's going on at Waterdam Church. So the assignments that I have, the readings that I have are all things that I am to maybe apply instantly um, or apply over time or prepare um, over time. But the seminary itself is, is so I can take what I'm learning in seminary and then share it with the church. And one of my assignments is, it's a long one, it's to preach through the statement of faith. And the Waterdam Statement of Faith is 10 articles. Um, so the times when I get up here, I, I, I'm going through this, the different articles. And I think I started in February or March, started with Article 1, and that's God. We talk about the triune God, the holiness of God. Um, article number 2 is the Bible, and that's our foundation. That's how we know who God is. That's how we, we, we stand on the Bible. That's how we know how to... Um, become more Christ-like. Um, statement number three is the human condition, and that's the one that hits the hardest, the, you know, the, the, the sinful man, the, the need for a Savior. Statement four is the Savior. It's Jesus, fully man, fully God. Statement number five leads us into the work of Christ. So the work that the Savior did for us to save us. And then today is uh, statement number six, and it's the Holy Spirit. Um, and I love our statement of faith. I've said this before. I love the statement of faith. And the reason I love the statement of faith is because it is the gospel. It is the gospel. It, it walks you step by step through the gospel. So you start with God, the creator of all things, in the Bible. And we know, you know, we need the Bible. And then it goes into, you know, the fallenness of man, Adam and Eve and the, the, the sinner in need of a Savior into Christ, and then the work of Christ, and now we're talking about the Holy Spirit because the result of the work of Christ is that when the sinner puts their faith in Christ, that we become indwelled with the Holy Spirit. So that, and that's, that's the gospel. That's part of the gospel, and that's, I love that about our statement of faith. I, I absolutely love that. Um, the one thing that we absolutely believe in is the Trinity. Um, we are Trinitarian. We believe that God is, 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 is three equal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in one essence. We believe that three in one, co-equal, three distinct, co-equal, infinite, Infinite, from the beginning, they were always together. Infinite, always will be together, um, persons. And while they have separate roles, they have absolutely separate roles, um, they reveal themselves in completely distinctive ways. In, in knowing that, there's some guidelines that we have to understand, some things that we need to understand as we look at the distinct co-equal, infinite persons of God. And one of the things that we have to do, if you want to call it a role, one of the things that we have to do is we have to understand that any attribute that we give to God the Father, it applies to God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. So it's really easy to think about the attributes of God. We talk about it all the time. God's you know, all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. Um, he's loving. God's loving. And the neat thing about God being loving and how he loved us first is God loved first because of the Trinity, because God was never alone. God always loved the Son. God always loved the Spirit. So there was always love. In the beginning, there was always love, and that's the love that we have when we have the Holy Spirit living inside us. God is just. He's a God. He's a just God. 
in, in, in all ways. Even when it hurts us, he's still just. He's convicting. He's very convicting. But of, among all the attributes of God, of the Son, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, is holiness. God is holy. The Son is holy. And obviously the Spirit, we call the Spirit the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is holy. And they've always been in agreement with each other. There's never been a disagreement between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They've always been in complete harmony. They're never trying to outdo each other or outglorify each other. Um, they work together they're, they're perfectly. Um, and in Scripture, what you'll see is one is always glorifying the other. The Son talks about glorifying the Father. The Spirit glorifies the Son. And when they glorify each other, they're really glorifying themselves at the same time. So it's, it, they're always working. There's complete unity within the Trinity. And there's no chaos. There's absolutely zero chaos with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and within the Trinity. Now, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So let's get our Greek on right now, okay? The, the Greek term for uh, spirit is pneuma, pneuma, that's Greek. Now, the, the, the uh, Hebrew is rocha. I didn't get any on you, did I, when I said that? Okay, you're good, all right, good. So it's rocha. And that means spirit, it means breath, it means wind. And that's why in John 3, 8, when Jesus is talking with Nicodemus, he says that the wind blows as it wishes. And he says that you hear the sound, but you don't know where it's coming from and you don't know where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So he says it, it's just like God the Father who is the creator of all things, sustainer of all things. That's hard to understand. Just like the Son, who is fully God, fully man, and that's hard to understand. The Holy Spirit is hard to understand. We're not going to fully understand the Holy Spirit either because he's God. We're not meant to do that. And even when we're glorified, when we're in heaven, I don't know if God's going to reveal everything. Like, I, I don't know that. And... Probably not, because he's God. We will never fully understand God. So the Holy Spirit is like a mystery. In, 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 in my opinion, the Holy Spirit is the neglected person of the Trinity. And sometimes he's just misunderstood. And sometimes he can be abused, too. Like, people can have a, a distorted view of the, the Holy Spirit. Now, when I was growing up, when I was growing up, I, I went to a church that referred to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Ghost. And that would scare me. Like, that scared me. It frightened me. Like, the Holy Ghost. Like, just the word ghost, you know? I, I grew up with, like, Chili Billy, you know, in the Terminal Stair, and, and Scooby-Doo. And, like, any time I heard the word ghost, it, I was, like, afraid. I was frightened. And the Holy Ghost was scary to me. It was, it was a scare. He was a scary thing because it's, it was a ghost. In the way it was portrayed, scary. But now I'm all grown up. I'm, I'm not afraid of ghosts anymore. Um, and, and the Holy Spirit is God. And that changes everything. When you can understand who he is and what he's done, it's absolutely amazing and it's eye-opening. So, so let's look at the statement of faith. Okay, excuse me, Article 6 of the Statement of Faith. Now, that should say the Holy Spirit, not the work of Christ. That would be uh, my uh, error, so forgive me for that. But the Holy Spirit, we believe that the Holy Spirit and all that he does glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. He convicts the world of its guilt. He regenerates sinners, and in him they are baptized into union with Christ, and adopted heirs in the family of God. He also indwells, illuminates, guides, equips, and empowers believers for Christ-like living and service. So that is Article 6 of the Statement of Faith. So 
when we look at this, and, and I asked uh, Scott to read um, chapter 16, um, when we look at this, the first thing that, that, that jumps out is, is we believe that the Holy Spirit, in all that he does, all that he does, the first thing that jumps out at me is the he. The Holy Spirit is a he, masculine. It's a, it, he's a he, not an it. Why is this important? Because sometimes our doorbells will ring, and we'll get a knock on the door from people, and sometimes they're in their uniform. It's typically a short sleeve white shirt with a black tie, very well-pressed white short sleeve shirt, and they'll, they'll ask you questions, and they'll talk to you about their Bible, and they'll talk to you about the Holy Spirit, um, who they refer to as an it. They refer to as the Holy Spirit as something that is created of God, not God himself. So, my good friend Dan Emmett says there's a lot of good stuff in the Bible, and I totally agree with that. There is a lot of good stuff in the Bible. But, amen, amen. But there's a lot of stuff in the Bible, and it's hard to wrap your head around everything and remember everything, especially when somebody knocks on your door and they catch you off guard. Or that person at work who you've been waiting to have a conversation about Jesus with, and they walk up to you and they ask you a question, and you're thinking about the charter graft from the Johnson file, and they come up to you and they're like, what is up with the reason that you guys do this? Okay, So they catch you off guard, and that's okay. That's all right, and it's okay to feel caught off guard. And when the, the Jehovah Witness or the Mormon comes to your door and tries telling you that, the Holy Spirit is an it, or the Holy Spirit is, is uh, created from God. There's scripture we can go to. We don't have to memorize the whole Bible. I guarantee you that 80% of us have a phone attached to our back pocket or our front pocket when we just walk to the front door when somebody's knocking on the door. Open your phone up and just type in, the Holy Spirit is he, and scripture will pop up to you. And the scriptures that will pop up are scriptures like 1 Corinthians 12, 11. So this is Paul. This is Paul talking about the Holy Spirit. After he gets done telling you like the, what the Holy Spirit's going to do, how the Holy Spirit's going to empower you, he says all these, he's talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit when he says these. All these gifts are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So that's Paul. Paul's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's giving you the gifts. He, he gives you the gifts as he wills. Now that's interesting because one, it's a proof text that, that the Holy Spirit is a he, is he, him. So that's Paul talking. The other thing that's really neat within this, this uh, passage right here is that our gifts, the gifts that we get from the Holy Spirit are given to us by his will. Like, it wasn't like a deck of cards where he was like, okay, you get this, I get that, 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 that. It's nothing like that. He specifically gives you the gifts that you have, the gifts and abilities that you have, or from his will to glorify him, to glorify God, to glorify the, the, the son. Now, we have this, this thing that I do, and it's wrong, but I do it anyways. When somebody comes up to me and they say, I want to serve at the church. I want to do these things. I want to do something. I want to help out. And I say to them, well, what do you want to do? And they're like, well, I don't know. And I say, Meredith, this is how I started. I said, well, you need to get into children's ministry. That's what I say to everybody. Have you thought about doing children's ministry? But that's me. Like, that's not the, I don't know what the Holy Spirit's will for that person is. I'm like, have you tried this? No. Have you tried teaching? Have you tried that? Um, but the Holy Spirit knows what your gifts are. He's willed them to you. He's given them to you. Another uh, text that proves that the Holy Spirit is he is, get, again, Paul, and it's in Romans. So that it's Romans 8.26. So Romans 8.26 Paul's talking about the future glory, um, and he says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Okay, that's comforting. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep 
for words. The Spirit himself. So there's Paul saying the Holy Spirit's a he himself. But the really cool thing is when we don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit knows exactly what we mean when we're praying. He knows exactly what God needs to hear from us. He knows what's going in the deepest parts of our us. There's nothing, there's nothing that's too deep. So Paul, that's Paul. But what about Jesus? What does Jesus say about the Holy Spirit? Well, if I'm going to take anybody's word, I'm going to take the word of the one that walked on water and the one that rose from the dead. So in John, John 16, verses 5 through 9, You have Jesus say, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. He's saying he's going to God. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go... I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So there you have Jesus, the Son, referring to the Holy Spirit as a him, as he. And what is he doing? So Jesus is he, or excuse me, the Holy Spirit is he. He's glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. He glorifies him, and that's, that's in John also, John 16, 12 through 15. I still have many things to say to you, but I cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Martin Lloyd-Jones is awesome. If you've never listened to him, go online and listen to some of his uh, sermons. His teachings are great. He passed away in like 1980, 81. So he's like an old school um, preacher, teacher. And his recordings are older, so you can hear, like, the line going through. It's really cool. But the one thing that he says all the time is he'll say the same thing. He says, now, the most important aspect of the Bible is wherever he is at that given moment. And he says it week after week. The most important thing is this right here, right now. The most important thing that the Holy Spirit does is glorifies Jesus. I say that right now, but later on, I'm probably going to say this. The most important thing that he does is indwell us because everything he does is important. But he's glorifying Jesus, and Jesus talks about it right here. And what is he glorifying him in? He's glorifying him in the declaration of the gospel. He says, when the truth comes, he says, there's so many things I want to tell you. I want to tell you. He's talking to the, the, the disciples. I want to tell you so much more, but you can't handle it. You don't understand it. You're not going to be able to comprehend it. Why? Because you don't have the Holy Spirit yet. But when he does, when he comes upon you guys, it's going to be a game changer. It's going to be awesome. And everything that the Father's declared, his decrees, his plan of salvation, the gospel, you're going to get it. You will totally understand it. And at that point, you're going to take it out to the world. So think of, the, of Acts when the Holy Spirit, where, where were they? They were in the upper room. They were afraid of their own shadow. They were afraid of the Jews. They were afraid of the Romans. They were hiding. And then the Holy Spirit came upon them. And there were like 5 million people in Jerusalem at the time. And what did Peter do? Peter ran out and he started proclaiming the gospel. He was declaring the gospel. It's the Trinity at work. You have God the Father with his decree. Everything that he willed, everything is glorified through him. So the Father's will, the accomplishment of the Son on the cross, beating death, raising from the grave. So you have the glorification of the Father. You have the accomplishment of the Son. And then you have the power of the Holy Spirit that gets applied to the believer. That's Peter running out, telling people about Jesus, telling them about the gospel, how to be saved. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And it's the Trinity. 
they're in perfect complementary action towards each other. They complement each other perfectly. And that's what Christ is talking about when he's saying that, that the Holy Spirit will glorify him. He convicts the world of guilt. So go, go, go north a little bit on John, John 16, 7 and 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the advocate. Scott, I think yours said the counselor. Is that what yours verse? Yeah. The counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And there's two parts to that, that conviction of what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit convicts the world. So the world knows about the sin. The world knows that what they're doing. The world gets it. They know that. But that whole aspect of the helper, the advocate, the counselor, the the Greek of that is the paraclete, okay, or the paracletus. And if you think about that word, think about like a paralegal. So the paralegal is the helper to the attorney. So it's the helper. And when, when God talks about judgment a lot of times he uses the courtroom as as, as the, the backdrop and that and that's what he's doing here he's talking about the helper because he comes alongside us and he helps us with the world so now we can see what's going on in the world and we have the holy spirit to to filter that through so we can see the craziness that's going on in the world and we get it we see it we can see when people do the things that they do, and the world approves the things that it approves, like not supporting the sanctity of life, we don't walk alongside that. We go totally against that. We lift up life. We save life. And that's what the world, that's the Holy Spirit coming alongside us, opening our eyes, illuminating things. He convicts the world. He regenerates sinners. We must be born again. In the Old Testament, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36, is regeneration at its finest. It's, it's the proclamation, it's the promise that God made to explain regeneration. And it's exactly how Paul explains it when Paul talks in Ephesians about the dead man, okay? Okay. This is Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. This is, this is the Lord talking. This is God the Father. I will sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, from all your idols. I will cleanse you. That's the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart. A new spirit will be put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from, the, from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So that's God the Father talking about the spirit. When the spirit comes, what does he do? He changes our heart. He takes that heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh. And that's the same conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus in uh, John chapter 3. He says, you know, how how do we be saved? And Jesus says, you have to be born again. How are you born again? Well, you have a dead heart. A heart of stone does not pump blood. A heart of stone, you can't get blood from a rock. You can't get blood from a stone. A heart of stone will not pump blood. You need a new heart. You need to be born again. How do you do that? You put your faith in Christ. And when you do that, your heart of stone turns to a heart of flesh. When Reagan was like three or four years old, we have this video of her, and she's standing in the, uh, the hallway with her little ukulele, and she's singing this song, and it goes like this. It goes like, a porcupine got dead one day. The Holy Spirit made him alive again. Okay? So this is a three or four-year-old. She does not understand gener- uh, regeneration. She doesn't understand salvation at its fullest. But what this little child understood was that 
you needed the Holy Spirit in your body. You needed to be, you needed a spirit in you to be saved, to be brought back to life. So she goes on for about a minute and a half about how the porcupine got hit by a car and the lights came down and took them up. And like, so there's this, the, the aspect of the child was there. And then at the very end of it, she says, oh, my Holy Spirit. And I'm like, wow, you get it. But you don't, but you do. You must be born again. Your heart of stone must turn into a heart of flesh. That is when the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the regeneration. It's being made alive. And when this happens, when this happens, that is when the baptism and the union with Christ, that's when that adoption kicks in, and that's when we're heirs of the family of God. And look at it like this. And I, I like to use the spider uh, analogy. And if Jesus was in the middle and, and there's a web, all believers are, are the, the web goes from me to you to everybody in this room. We're all connected by this web with Christ in the center of the web and then God over top of it all. So we are all, we're all in union because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the regeneration of our hearts. And we're heirs. We're heirs to the same family. We're heirs to heaven. We're heirs to eternal salvation, to being forever with our Father. This is the weird part of the statement of the article here that, that, that gets wonky because of the sarcastic person in me. Like, all this amazing thing that the Holy Spirit does, okay, which is the most important part of what the Holy Spirit does, right? And then the wording in this is like, and he also indwells, illuminates, guides, equips, and empowers. Like, all this greatness, and then, oh, go, by the way, he also does this, too. Like, it's amazing, like, what he does. Like, this is the most important aspect of what he does, because it's for, like, this, like, but anyways, it's not. It's, it's always the glorification of, of, of the Son. But what does he do? He indwells us. He indwells us. And that's 1 Corinthians. If you'll turn to 1 Corinthians 3.16, you'll see that, that the Holy Spirit, he indwells us. And, and this is Paul again. He says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. So when he indwells us, we're saved. We become the temple of God. We become everything that the temple in, in Jerusalem represented. We are now that. We are the temple of God. We are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. And then what does he do? He illuminates everything. He makes things clear. It's almost like we have another sense. You know, you have your sight, you have your taste, you have your hearing, and now you have another sense because he's making things clear. We understand things. We understand things of the world. It goes back to, to that, that convicting thing. But he, but he also lets us see things. We're able to read the word of God like you never could before. An unsaved person can read the Bible, but an unsaved person does not understand what the Bible is telling us. You need the Holy Spirit to do that. The Holy Spirit will guide us. He illuminates everything. He gives us understanding that we'll never know. Um, that the veil is, is removed. The veil is, is removed when we turn to Christ. When our hearts are changed, the veil is totally removed and we can see. That's 2 Corinthians 3.16 talking about Moses and in the, in the, in how the veil was removed. He guides us. Just as the Holy Spirit guides us, was the guide for Christ into the wilderness. He led him into the wilderness. He led him through the wilderness. The Holy Spirit does the same thing with us. How many times have we been walking? We've been doing something, and we do something that we're, is like totally out of character for us, and it was a good thing. Like, I would have never done that. I never would have went that way. And then you find out that there was some car accident that happened, and you're like, wow. Like, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit working through us. It's the grace of God. It's being able to see things. It's being able to do things. 
He equips us for every good work to edify and build up his church. And he does this in a, in a couple ways. He, he gives us gifts and abilities, right? And that, that's what I'm talking about earlier when I said they're his will. The gifts that we have are his will. They come directly for him to glorify him, to glorify the Father. Some of us are prayer warriors and we're encouragers. And that's a gift that, from the Holy Spirit. Some of us pray constantly. Some of you come up to, and tell us things and they're like, we've been praying for you. I don't know what's going on, but I know there's a lot. And that's amazing. That's a gift. Like, that is a gift. Some of us have the ability to build things and to make things. And, and that's from God, too. That's from the Holy Spirit. Some of us can teach. That's a gift of the Spirit. He gives us these things. The full armor of God is spiritual armor that we receive from the Holy Spirit. And Pastor Jack talked about that a couple weeks ago. We receive these things. We receive these gifts from the Holy Spirit. My man is Vody Bauckham. I love him to death. He's, he, I was listening to him the other day, and he, he brought up Romans uh, 8.11. And he was talking about, and Romans 8.11 says this, that the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also Give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And what Vody Bauckham was talking about was this. He's like, that spirit that brought Christ back from life, like raised a man from the dead, lives inside you. He was like, there is nothing that you cannot do because of the spirit of God that lives inside you. And he went on to talk about all the different things that, that we go through in life. And he was like, that spirit raised somebody from the dead. Raised the son of God from the dead. It can do anything in your life too. He empowers us for Christ-like living and service. What is that? Every day, that's sanctification. Our sanctification process comes from Christ. Every day we are to become more and more Christ-like. And we do that through the fruit of the spirit. We, got, we, we, we do that in, in loving, we joyfully loving people in peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, patience, self-control. We got the fruit. We have the fruit. Then the fruit, what the Holy Spirit produces is fruit, not chaos. There is no chaos with the Holy Spirit. We get mercy, and we're to apply that mercy to others. We are forgiven, and we are to pl apply that forgiveness to others. And there are two verses it, uh, this is my, my Martin Lloyd-Jones. Two of the most important verses in the Bible that scare me are James 3.1. 1, uh, 1, talks about how teachers and preachers will be judged more strictly. Scares me to my core. In uh, Matthew um, 6.14, it's right after the Our Father, right after the, the Lord's Prayer. And he says, you must forgive because your Father forgives you. But if you don't forgive, your father won't forgive you. Like, think about that for a moment. That is some scary stuff. Like, if we can't forgive people, then the Lord's not going to forgive us. We need the work of the Holy Spirit to help with that. So why is this all important? This is important for a couple of things. And in, in to in piggyback off of what Pastor Jack talked about last week, eternal salvation is applied to us from the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit indwells us, he doesn't leave us. That's a, that, he does not leave us. We are saved, and that's, that's security. That's our sanctification, or excuse me, that's, uh, that, that's our salvation right there, the Holy Spirit. People ask me, they, they'll say, how do I know I'm saved? I, I don't know if I'm saved. And I'll say to them, do you love God? They say, yeah. Do you sin? Yeah. When you sin, do you feel like you are? Your sin is an offense to a holy God. Does it tear you apart? And they're like, absolutely. And I would say that's, that's the work of the Holy Spirit right there. That is the work. Another thing is evangelism. Having the power of the Holy Spirit to share Christ with people. Like that's where we get everything from. That's the declaration. That's, where, that's what glorifies Christ. That's what Jesus was talking about when Peter went out glorifying Christ, and then prayer. 
It's important because of prayer. Because we pray to the Father. We pray through the Son. And because of the work of Christ on the cross, we're able to, to, to go to God. Because the veil was torn in two, top to bottom. And then that gives us access to the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we pray to the Father through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. That, that's what we need. We must be born again. We must be born again. And that salvation comes through the Holy Spirit. That's putting your faith in Christ. That's turning from your sin, repenting of your sin, and putting your faith in Christ. So as we pray, let us focus on the work of the Holy Spirit. Let us focus on what he's doing today in our lives. And, and we pray as he leads us and guides us. Father, we just thank you for your plan, your master plan we thank you for your son and the accomplishment that he had on the cross and in the, the grave. Father, we thank you for the application of the Holy Spirit that is applied to everybody who repents of their sins and puts their faith in your son. How once we're indwelled with that Holy Spirit, our heart is changed. Our heart is changed instantly. It goes from, from a, a dead rock that does not pump blood to flesh, a heart of flesh that pumps blood, that makes us alive, that makes us alive in your spirit, Lord. So we ask you that if there are people here that haven't put their faith, open their eyes, open their hearts to you, to the works of your son, Lord. Change their hearts. Give them a new heart. Give them a heart of flesh. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for all that you do, all the work that you do in our lives, the unifying of us with the Father. We thank you for that. And Jesus, we praise you for all things. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. So to Martin Lloyd-Jones, this, the most important aspect of the Holy Spirit is the fact that we're all together. Like the, the church is bound together by the Holy Spirit. And then we're bound in unity with Christ and our Lord, our Father in heaven. So here are the words of the benediction. It's taken from 2 Corinthians 13. 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God bless. Amen.